there are a lot of challenges ahead, definitely. But uh, what is important is that we like the step by step. Hello, and welcome to the business of architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this is part two of my interview with Geronimo Van Schendel, where he focuses on his own entrepreneurial ventures, um, where he is the CEO and co-founder at Buildia, which is an estimating and procurement software platform for the construction industry. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Geronimo Van Schendel. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Geronimo, welcome back to the Business of Architecture for part two of our conversation. How are you? Very good. Thank you very much, Ryan, again for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and share some quality time. Excellent. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed the last part of our conversation. It was incredibly illuminating. And one thing that we only started to touch on was your involvement with your own entrepreneurial venture, which is Buildia. So I was wondering, perhaps you could introduce us to Buildia, what it is and how it was born. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Buildia is, uh, first of all, it's a, a wonderful adventure, a personal and professional adventure. Um, but if I had to define it, uh, I would say we are the supply chain software and ecosystem for construction. At the moment, we're starting in Spain, but obviously we have a, a global ambition. And what we do in short is... is on the one hand, streamlining procurement for builders and putting all their data to work uh, and bring traceability to their subcontractors ecosystem. We do that in part using AI to optimize um, a lot of their um, a lot of their uh, tenders to their clients, so developers and so on. So they they actually make uh, offers that are that are correct, and also uh, to optimize a lot of the processes downstream. Uh, and on the other hand, we also help construction manufacturers to integrate their ecosystem of uh, B2B clients. And by B2B clients, I mean the resellers, distributors, uh, installators, which are also subcontractors um, and builders um, on a basically a proprietary, super specific construction e-commerce platform that connects the offline and the online sales with uh, production processes and data. And as I was saying, it's, it's very specific to construction because in construction, the supply chain stakeholders have a very different way of acting than in other manufacturing industries mm -hmm. um, and for good. I mean, they play a role that we we we, we value, we cherish the role of, of distributors, the role of uh, installators and so on. And we bring them to the digital world enhancing their relationships with buyers and sellers um, using technology. So the key to our, I would say, to our strategy in a very short um, couple of words, but perhaps we will have more time to, to dwell on that, is that our products operate independently, uh, independently for each company. We, what that means is that, you know, every company can operate our software with their own ecosystem of, of uh, collaborators, uh, uh, independently, but they can also be benefit from being uh, connected to our network. And um, yeah. So, so what was the, the kind of market problems or the industry issues that you were outlining or kind of finding that led to this, to the, the kind of creation of the business? Yeah. Uh, well, in B2B, uh, explaining problems um, can often get tricky because they can get very complex, but I'll try to be synthetic. Basically, um, you know, construction procurement or I would say construction supply chain is very, very core to our business because it's a it's an industry of prototypes. Right. So that means, you know, building infrastructure or any other thing in the build environment that is actually built is a prototype, regardless of how much level of uh, digitalization you put in or how much uh, pre-construction uh, prefabrication you put in, it's always going to be a prototype. So that means that our supply chain is project dependent, it's ever changing, and that implies that you have to basically 
restructure from scratch your ecosystem of products, services, and 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 systems for every project or every you know construction site. Um, and the way it's done as a result of that complexity and, and that fragmentation is still very very rudimentary, very you know based on hands or 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 basic digital processes like email and Excel calls and as a result of that there's very little centralization of all those processes at the level of the company between the different teams from pre-construction to procurement to site management on the side of the builder but also on the side of the manufacturer from the persons or the people that uh, manage sales to the people that manage production and uh, and and you know um, uh, pricing for for the different products and systems and so on in the end in very short it is about um, repetition Endless repetition of low value adding processes that are inefficient, that yeah. leave 100% of all the data of the data on top of the table. And in, that's a massive waste of an opportunity for companies that operate in an industry that is about optimization, basically. Um, and what we do is, you know, bringing all of that digital, automating, centralizing and putting all that data to work in a simple way. That's really interesting, actually, because when we consider something like the manufacturer of a car or an iPhone or a product, which is completely repeatable, pretty much every model that you're making, the supply chain kind of cements itself and becomes a little bit more, um, yeah, solid and predictable. And as yeah. you say, it's very interesting to consider in reality, all buildings are prototypes. Um, and as a result, then we end up having um completely new su supply chains and when you look at companies like coca-cola or apple or, or 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 tesla they spend years and years and years developing those solid supply chains yeah. and you have massive consulting firms like um deloitte who have supply chain specialists who are helping them design that out so that's uh, that's a very very um a very very interesting kind of thing to be to be looking at so h how exactly then um is it purely with contractors then that you're working with or you're working with the design teams as well yeah well uh what i think what, what makes us i would say radically different as far as i understand or you know i judge personally is that uh we we work in the industry from two big ends. Uh, one end is, you know, the, the contractor, yes, uh, but also our system can be used for by by developers. Certain developers, depending on the markets, do take a little bit of responsibility of the uh, procurement uh, capacity. And as we move in our industry to an open contract or open book contracting mm -hmm. um, scenario, more and more there is a collaboration between developer and builder on the management of uh, the ecosystem of resources and the prices and all of that. So we allow that kind of dynamic on the one hand. And then we also serve, on the other hand, the, the, um, the manufacturers but our softwares help them to integrate their networks. That's key. We don't base our value in the connectivity between a company that doesn't know other company and we establish that link. We certainly can do so. And we have a growing network and that's you know, part of our USP, but it's a very little part compared to the optimization of what we can do in terms of everything that I explained between companies that already know each other. And that's a key in construction you build relationships since you cannot spend your time building that supply chain that is endless infinitely you know or perfectly repeatable then you spend your yeah. time building relationships so uh, those relationships are key you know and and a lot of initiatives we find in the world uh, about this we do quite a lot of research about that is our initiatives based on breaking those links and bringing those in a different way to the digital world. And that, in our opinion, simply doesn't work. You have to understand the value of those relationships and use technology to reinforce that. Now, to your second part of the question, I believe, which is what is the role of the architect? What is the role of the engineer um, uh, as a prescriber of, um, of the many of the things that end up um, being put on a, on a construction site? Um, things and services. Um, we we do not serve them with software directly, uh, especially in the case of architects. But ne but uh, regardless of that, so nevertheless, uh, in our vision, they do have a very clear role to play. We just haven't yet expanded that massively. But what mm -hmm. we're working now 
with manufacturers is something that we call the information center for manufacturers, basically, which is helping to centralize, first of all, simplify on the one hand, and then centralize all the information from different manufacturers. Each manufacturer man manages their own center of information in a place where you can see really, you know, what's, what are really those systems, what are the pros and cons, a sort of an academy of implementation and decision making on these manufacturers. And what happens in the industry is that when people try to do that, they do it either for themselves, which means that they're going to go to the very last corner of the information and it ends up being useless, you know, because you don't really need to know every, every single de detail in one product or system uh, in order to take a design decision uh, at a conceptual level and then evolve yeah. over that decision. But you need to know 80% of that, just to say, you know, a percentage. And the problem is if you go to that 100%, it becomes almost impossible to standardize and centralize information. So we are on that role of kind of democratizing that, that access to comparable information and helping manufacturers to do that simply. How does this kind of system or process sit alongside more of the kind of contemporary construction techniques that we're beginning to see emerge, like modular construction, for example, which I would imagine is also trying to kind of solve a lot of the issues that you're discussing here in terms of supply chain? And what we end up having then is architects needing to be able to design with inside of a system, which has its own problems as well but also creates a lot of different opportunities. But then on the back end of it, on the procurement side of it, well, then we are starting to be able to get things which are much more stabilized in terms of supply chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, you, you, of course, have radical examples, right? And we've all seen on these, uh, you know, uh, 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 very, very, you know, with massive audience videos that run around WhatsApp or YouTube that, those buildings that are built in a few days and and um, things that are extremely modular, yeah. I believe deeply in the in that direction, of course, for the industry, and I think it provides a lot of good things if we allow within the cases that need to allow it um, some space for for design and creativity. Um, I deeply believe in that. It, 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 it makes things cheaper, faster, more reliable, more safe for everyone. It, it definitely makes it. Now, that's going to take a lot of time if we are realistic. It's like when they tell you, you know, like z net zero buildings are now almost, you know, again, z zero consumption and so on. And that, that doesn't really mean that the built environment is zero consumption because until you have 100% of those buildings operating under those premises, you likely are going to have hundred years passing. So um, with this, it's going to be much faster, but I definitely don't think there's going to be uh, uh, an, a night and day change in things like five years or 10 years. I think it's going to take a lot. And even like that, um, the process implies always a combination of products, services, and systems that some of them are done in factories. Some others are designed with the modules, but then you know mounted on site and so on. Um, and, and we still have a lot, lot of room to improve there in, the, in bringing all of that together in one place, optimizing how you understand how you procure all of that. For those cases where it is a designer that designs directly on a factory, basically on a software of a factory, and that factory mounts that, um, mm -hmm. then we, we do have a line, a strategic line that is not yet being implemented. But as we understand where the market goes, we sort of thing five years ahead, uh, 10 years ahead maybe. And then in that line, it's it would be pretty easy for us or it's something we we have, you know, conceptualized to uh, progressively move into a hybrid model that brings together uh, models of supply chain more related to the ones you were mentioning, Tesla and so on, and models of supply chain more related to construction. And there's going to be a hybrid for a very, very long time. So uh, we believe yeah. there's a competitive advantage there if we are able to do that. And if you bring in our systems, you allow buyers to be sellers and sellers to be buyers. That helps a lot because um, um, a manufacturer, for instance, to give you a simplified example, I hope it's clear what I'm going to say. Um, for instance, a manufacturer that at the moment only 
buys a raw matter um, or raw materials and transforms that and sells a, a manufactured material that then needs to be put into a construction system on site. If they become a digital manufacturer that produces, for instance, modular houses, yep. they will still have to be uh, getting you know, raw, raw materials from one place and constituting their own supply chain and selling that into a bigger system, which is a building with an urbanization and many other things. So there is total room if you build the right ecosystem to bring those worlds together. It sounds very complex, but mm -hmm. it is long term. And I think that helps a lot. Is there actually the, the kind of trading or exchanges that happen on the platform in terms of you mean transactional? Of you mean yeah. transactional? Well, I mean, definitely there is a. If I'll, I'll bring that question down, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. If you if you if your question is whether they pay or not through the platform, for the moment they don't. Right. Um, we are moving very fast towards that possibility. Um, our vision is how can we, or how should we, uh, basically um, provide value uh, in that in that capacity. Uh, when you, in other words, when you provide the capacity of buy or, or, or of paying or charging through a platform. What is the value that you're providing on top of that? Because you know already in the world you have platforms where you can buy and sell. The bank sure. is one of those platforms, right? So, but what is the value that because you are specifically in construction, um, you can add to that? And in this case, for instance, we're in an industry that again, because it's so fragmented and because it's so poorly um, transparent, if you want, and many other things um, in terms of like heavy in terms of movement of materials and so on, it's extremely risky. So. When you reduce the risk, financial and, and real risk through that uh, infrastructure, then uh, then paying via platform makes sense for everyone. Right. Or when you provide you know capacity for medium, small and medium enterprises to finance themselves better by using a certain platform to channel their funds, then then you help. But our business model in the short and medium term, I would say, from now to two years from now doesn't base its value or doesn't you know focus its 100% of the value there but on optimization on data and on the adding artificial intelligence to the processes and so on i That's see i i'm I, yeah cuz i'm kind of kind of conceptualizing of it a little bit like a project management tool which allows you to almost design your shopping cart of all the different pieces that you want to have in the building and yeah. being a, and having like a kind of catalog which you're able to directly go to vendors and then it, yeah it, then it kind of makes sense well if you're able to do that and then kind of get all the timings in and coordinate and curate how the supply chain and pieces are going to work then the next step is then well what happens if you start purchasing them through the platform as well and it's almost exactly. like as a developer you've bought the whole you've bought all the pieces for the building through the platform it's all curated it's all kind of you've worked out your lead times and when things are going to become and then that becomes quite a that's pretty epic. Yeah, it is, it is pretty it is pretty complex and pretty epic. Of course, that's what keeps us you know uh, engaged and so motivated about our business. I would say what makes us different in our vision about how to achieve that is that we deeply and from a core, very very central conviction in our company, we while we transition towards that scenario, we bring to the equation or we keep in the equation the resellers and the distributors and the service professionals which in uh, many many cases is not the is not the the vision for uh, startups not only in our industry but also in other industries that are heavy in terms of supply chain and i think that construction is the one industry if you want where the channel is important um mm -hmm. And, and this is something that, you know, even companies like Amazon struggle to sell construction products online by reorganizing the supply chain uh, agents because, you know, it's not the same putting in a little last mile truck, um, I don't know, a box of shoes and uh, a, a cup of pens or, and, and two mobiles or tablets than <laughs> having to put in the same truck, you know, a pallet of bricks uh, or, 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 you know, a, a prefab concrete beam or, uh, together with a small light bulb, you know, it's like completely <laughs> mind blowing. So, <laughs> um, and then on top of that physicality of the channel that is super important, that helps into having goods distributed closely, um, and they, they also have a, a very important role in, in, in prescription, 
uh, if you if you see it that way, like in 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 going closer to the uh, service professionals, helping them to make the right decisions, getting the right pool of products, and so on. And we believe it's it's for good. So um, we have come up with a system where we can bring them into the equation and we enhance their relationships with manufacturers and also with uh, general contractors. So that's that's what I believe may may make us grow slower than than we could if we if we wanted to go the other way. But we will hopefully, but at least in our vision, we will go farther. Basically, Amazing. that's what I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about the team and your co-founders? Because, again, you, you you guys here are really drawing upon a lot of different elements of the construction industry. What kind of experience do all of you guys bring to the table? Because and just looking at who's involved, this seems quite like quite an extraordinary group. A group of you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think in in a startup, also in a company that you want to grow um, fast, or or even if you don't grow fast, if you want to do something relevant, I think the team is the number one thing, basically. Um, uh, and yes, the founders are super important, but I I would say even at least equally important is the vision that you have in terms of who do you bring to that team and. And how do you empower them to grow and build that culture and so on? So it is as important as hard, I must say. And it's a journey that is about learning for us as well. Um, but I, what I like to say always when we start speaking about this is we, of course, have to bring together the worlds of construction, um, uh, all the business worlds, you know, finance and all of that, um, uh, and then technology, design, UX design and all that. So very different fields where, you know, you need different types of professionals. On our case, we make a lot of effort, we put a lot of focus on and a lot of effort into bringing a very big proportion of the people that already have uh, experience in the construction industry, previous experience in relevant areas that are deeply related to the core of our business. So 65% of our staff at the moment has direct relationship with uh, different parts of the supply chain in construction, either because they've been selling to manufacturers or to builders B2B for a lot of years, or because they've been uh, you know, on, on the procurement teams on a general contractor, or or even developing B2B uh, or, or you know, construction marketplaces or construction uh, platforms for general contractors or for even like companies like Le Roi Merlin, the French do-it-yourself company and so on. So that's the first thing to say. Um, so we, we are very lucky to have a great team uh, and we are also very aware that we need to keep working on that team every day to, to, to grow. That's key. Uh, and to take the right decisions, most important even. Um, in terms of the founders, we are three co-founders. Uh, we have one founding advisor uh, which was, so to say, a, a founder, conceptually speaking, but that ended up uh, deciding that she wanted to have more the role of an advisor than a full-time founder. Sure. Um, and within those, you know, three of us come from the construction industry. Um, two of the full-time founders and the founding advisor with different roles. I mean, I come from more the architectural background, as you know. I also lead the MBR, but... Uh, um, I've had the opportunity by working on public and private buildings of different kinds and also even infrastructure of different kinds and in different countries to really understand what that problem was. Um, I have been able to collaborate or build even big, big consortia of companies to develop international projects and then lead part of that from the conceptualization of the design to the contract negotiation to site management. So I've seen quite a lot. I have myself never been a procurement manager, um, but I've dealt with a lot of them. And I right. believe, I humbly believe I, I, I have quite a lot of empathy for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but on the other side, um, my other co-founder is an architect and engineer as well and comes more from the side of project management, having been leading projects on the technical side, mainly for, I would say, high efficiency industries, for instance, building factories for Airbus or for um, other aviation brands um, that were 
I, I, I learned a lot by following his journey, actually, because it was, it was crazy that in the end, you're spending 20 million euros in a building, but, and you think you're the important part of it, but then they're, they're putting into it a, a, an airplane that is 250 million. So suddenly the building is like a joke, right? Uh, so the building ends up being absolutely engineered to satisfy the supply chain of the, of the airplane. So something that is completely counterintuitive, which is that a building has exactly the same degree of you know, precision uh, than an airplane ends up having to be like that. So a deviation in a factory building of like 10 centimeters, it's a, it's a total pain, right? So that kind of efficiency and mindset uh, was, is very built in into, into my other co-founder. And he leads operations now and, he, and leads uh, at the same time the sales machine on our, on our team at the moment. And then our CTO is a full stack developer, but he comes from the world of B2B development of, of platforms. And as I was mentioning before, was involved in super large project, obviously that involves hundreds of people, but was very involved in the, what now is the recently launched marketplace of uh, Le Roi Merlin, the, the French do-it-yourself giant, um, quite particularly in one of the areas that we inside Buildia deem extremely complex and they also had a really hard time, which is the, the, the organization of all the categories of data that you can have, right? Like all the fragmentation of products, services, how do you categorize that in a way that makes sense that you can build a machine that can learn afterwards from utilization and all of that. So in a way, standardizing a market that is almost impossible to standardize. So um, he comes from there and also from a family that has quite a lot of passion for the built environment. So, so, th so that's, that's Mency, is it? That's Mency, yeah. So you've got, so got Mency, Nicholas, so Nicholas Shen, Shendel, and then yeah. Monse, who's the advisor. And, and uh, I, I was about to speak about Monse. Monse is a, a dear friend before a co-founder uh, from the School of Architecture as well. Then we ended up specializing on different things. I already kind of explained a little bit my journey, but she was in the US at the same time that I was in the US. Um, she went to New York with a Fulbright and then she was studying more marketing and innovation on, on the side of marketing. Um, and then we started speaking about this problem that we both had experienced and she ended up specializing more on the UX and digital strategy for, for I would say, complex industries from construction and real estate to insurance or banking. Um, and she is now a, a very senior uh, consultant on, 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 on these areas. But on Buildia, she was very important at the beginning to help us bring to the ground all the possibilities that we could have to sort of... Um, narrow down something that was feasible yet at the same time uh, you know uh, um, ambitious enough and so on and, and and give shape to that very first version of Pildia. and since then well we we now and then we we touch base and she's you know an advisor basically oh, man, amazing um so how did you four all come together was it something that you you were kind of all four of you were thinking about or how did the kind of initial conversation start or was there a, a German of an idea between one of yeah. you and then you all, were all invited in to start the conversation? I, you know, I'm, I'm always, I listen a lot of podcasts of uh, entrepreneurship and uh, very different industries. And sometimes I have, um, I listen to these stories of companies that, you know, oh yeah, so we get together and in a cup of coffees, we were already doing the company and within six months we were, you know, paying <laughs> millions and then within three years we were, we were IPO, right? And I, I think that's great, but that's a, such a little percentage of, it, it's not such a little percentage of the companies. It's such a little percentage of the successful companies that I even think that it's, it's quite crazy that nobody else speaks in a much more open way about it. So I'm going to be very open about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so the, the way we started was basically, I started speaking to Monse while we were students in the master in the US, when we would gather in Boston or in, in, in New York, um, we were discussing about it and then had a very tiny concept. That concept was, was frozen for a number of years. She went to other industries in the US. I came, I went to San Francisco, worked a bit, then came to 
uh, Spain, worked for three years on, on, on construction and so on. And then we, and then she ended up coming back to live to Spain. And at that moment, then we kind of re reboot the, the conversations. We started speaking with a UX designer that was great, that had some vision about business and so on, was involved with us for a couple of months. Um, then went to live to Mexico. So all that work was kind of valuable, but ended up vanishing in, in, in one way. I'm still very, very thankful for him to him and I were dear friends. Um, and then I said, look, we need a technology person here. Otherwise we won't be, we won't be able to move forward unless we put a lot of money in. And more importantly, I believe that there's always core capacities in companies. And I didn't want to have a core capacity that was designed or there was construction only. I wanted to have right. two core capacities. One is construction and technology. That's it. What can we? What do we love? Construction and the build environment. What can we be the best at? Construction supply chain, and that's what you know needs technology. So we need to own that knowledge. So we found Mensi because Monse used to work with him on a previous digitalization projects on real estate and construction introduced to us and started working and it worked really well since the beginning because uh, in that case, yeah, it is a, it, it is an easy story because Mensi um, has also a lot of talent for design. I believe he's a very good programming professional, but he is a kind of professional that is really good also at writing, at, at expressing an idea and at, at looking at something that is poorly designed and saying, this cannot be this way. We need to we'll go one step back. And it's just not on code only. And that's such a big problem when you deal with technology uh, and vice versa as well. People that is in design and doesn't really understand what's about code or business and so on, right? So we, that, that was a, it's a tremendous asset for us. Um, so we, we connected very fast. And then Nicolas was at that time working in, in Airbus, well, working for Airbus, um, leading projects and um, we were already kind of speaking about how Buildia was evolving and he was one of the first testers, um, contributed even to like the branding, the initial branding and so on. And then at one time his life just, you know, kind of took a decision in life that was coming back to Spain. I'm, I've been always fully convinced that co-founders, at least for the beginning, need to be in the same place. Mm -hmm. uh, even if your team can be remote or partially remote. And that uh, made us, you know, at that time, kind of things naturally started falling in. Um, and and we decided to to start. We started on a call for ideas uh, from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. And there we got one of the prizes out of uh, 400 startups, I think there were. And, um, and that's when we took it full time. I mean, that process was when Monse decided that she really... Uh, wanted you know to be part of the project but but she still wanted to stay on the corporate world uh sure. to put a back to it and that's when we kind of structured the final setting where we are now amazing so what was the process like of developing the actual software itself because this is no easy task and can be quite expensive and can be a very quick pit of money just going in what what what, what was the process that you had to go through to actually develop the software? Was it something you were able to do in-house to begin with, or did you have to hire software developers? And kind of on top of that, where was, how did you raise finance to, mm -hmm. to do it? Was it your own personal money or did you go for seed investment or do you have investors or? Yeah, uh, it's a blend, but I'll, I'll give you the full answer. So after finishing my studies at Harvard, I had the chance, I, I've been always very interested in, in innovation. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I believe that designers innovate in the very process of design is a process of innovation, yeah. as much as also a process of kind of reflection or philosophy about status quo in life, the physical world in the case of architects. But I believed that there was a new, a different vision of innovation that was like, how can you approach scalable problems or problems that show the same pattern in different areas uh, within an industry or within the world in general? And I believe that the, the design of architects is much more like case-based, at least when I was at that time, right? Now, thanks to the evolution of our industry, I believe no longer anymore. But um, based on that thinking, I had the opportunity to go to work at IDO in San Francisco. And I was on a, on a lab where we were basically researching use cases for IoT uh, and for uh, blockchain at a time, which 2016, which blockchain was 
merely you know an upcoming technology it sounds like decades ago but it's it's been so fast that you know it was it was really none of the giants really was uh, global and so on right and there we something that i had liked quite a lot which was the designing concepts digital concepts and uh system thinking and all that i could put that into practice on a very demanding environment and creative environment for real clients very big corporations that were working on the development of these success cases. So I developed that. Uh, of course, I believe designers, architects are quite good in general in managing complexities. And, uh, you know, if your brain is flexible enough, you can translate that complexity of the design of a building into the complexity of the design of a digital system, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of a natural shift. And so I could cover for the beginning, I could cover that part. Um, Monse helped me quite a lot into the methodology, uh, which was, okay, how do you really do this the way the industry does it, right? The industry of UX does it. And she was fundamental to really understand that. Once it's understood, then you take it from there, right? But but she was fundamental. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, and then Mente, well, he, he was able to code the, the thing himself. Of course, we, we did things in a not so scalable way in the benefit of speed at the beginning, but still like that, we are in an industry and in an area within the industry, which is supply chain that is so core that we didn't have that mindset that, oh, let's build some sketchy MVP and take it to market in a couple of months. Because I knew that, you know, you don't, you don't get to channel all the core processes of a company in construction, which is time bound, money bound, and so on with a sketchy MVP. Maybe you can make a proof of concept, but they will never, you know, put their, put their trust of their process on you unless you have a very, very robust product. So we took longer than, than typical startups in getting the product out there, but we were, owning the design, owning the strategy. We knew where the product could go, left a lot of things on the table that are still on the table that we haven't been able to catch up with, but we're doing other things and that's it. And uh, in terms of financing it, so basically Mensei took the digital part. I took the design, the, the, the nitty gritty design part and functionalities and all of that. Monse took the strategy initially and then Nicolas took the very nitty gritty initial part I, I had done and, and moved it to a whole new level. Um, while I was moving to next steps, roadmap, uh, strategy, and so on, fundraising, and so on. At the beginning, because everything was in-house, we had the capacity to bootstrap it. So we right. put our own money. We didn't have to deploy that much money because we didn't subcontract anybody to program that. Mm -hmm. um, and because we're so B2B, we didn't really need to invest a lot of marketing initially to test whether that was the case or not. Um, and then very early on, we, a series of things we did, we, we were able to land a venture capital ticket, a pre-seed venture capital ticket from a German fund which was our first investor and which is a phenomenal fund, I have to say. Um, for their vision, their support, um, their ecosystem, and so on, which was, it's called APX, the three letters right. APX by, by actual Springer and by Porsche Ventures. And they have super long-term vision. They understand the industry. They understand digitalization. They bet on the team. And they were an amazing support, honestly. And now they're building actually a new fund that is called Heartfelt. And the very name of that really tells you a lot about how they see this. So... That was a 50K ticket. That was our initial um, investment. And with that, we took the company to market. We, we hired the first people. Uh, for quite a number of months, we were still not paying ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, but, we, but we were able to do it. Um, in Spain, the, the good thing is that you, you can live quite uh, efficiently, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, so we could bear that situation for quite a, quite a few months. And we paid the first UX designer to kind of optimize that design and the first tech person. And then from there, we started adding people, you know, um, uh, all their data sales and, and so on. Um, and now, yeah, we have different investors. We have APX, of course. We have uh, Indico Capital Partners, which is a great fund, shares a lot of that kind of vision from Portugal, but that invests in 
in Iberian startups. Now they have a very interesting fund, by the way, that is called the Blue Fund on Ocean Economy. Um, right. And then we raise from other funds like Enzo Ventures uh, that uh, and now Sherry Ventures that have um, that have uh, interesting construction that see the opportunity and that are um, you know brave enough to to bet on this industry that needs it so much. And, and what kind of relationship do you have with the in, investors? And were, and were you very keen to make sure that if you were taking on investment? Um, that you were going to be using people or kind of partnering with people who had industry specific knowledge and were able to bring another level of expertise. And it wasn't, it wasn't just purely finance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, I would, I would divide that category into three. Uh, right. And even if we had more time into more, but into three for me is what you call pure finance. Right. Then there's an in between, which is, Partners that are not specific to your industry, but can teach you a lot, really a mm -hmm. lot. And then there are industry specific partners. And um, we were not obsessed with having construction specific partners. We thought that, to be honest with you, for every level we had, at one point we had more gaps or more we needed to learn more things about business and about fundraising and about scaling operations than about construction for one mm -hmm. for, uh, and we were well surrounded by the right advisors in construction at this point now we really are valuing funds that have construction LPs, construction specifics and so on because they have also learned a lot of things of business on this industry particularly in the software industry but initially uh, for instance, APX does have, because Axel Springer owns Aviv Group, and Aviv Group is a massive real estate digital uh, company with presence in Israel and in many other places, and they know a lot of things that helped us quite a lot. But still, um, our most important thing there was how do you fundraise? How do you build a fundraising strategy that is not only for this round, but for three, four rounds ahead? How do you establish the right relationship between the founders? How do you make a, a shareholders agreement? All of the, these things we didn't really know, uh, and they helped us quite a lot. Um, and then other partners maybe are less strategic, but are more operational. They can connect you with a person that knows how to build a sales machine and so on. So we, we want, basically every fund plays a role, and that's important for us. That's, that's, what we, that's in short what we do. Um, right. Yeah. Amazing. And, and, and what's the, the kind of the vision for, for the business in terms of, do you have more rounds of investment planned? Um, yeah. and, and, and how do you kind of balance as you're going into, um, you know, working with investors, giving away equity in, in the company? How do you, as, how do you as, as founders deal with that, negotiate that? Yeah. Uh, and maintain, you know, maintain your control and maintain your clarity of vision of where you yeah. want to be going. I'll start with a joke. Uh, there's a dilemma in the business jargon that is the king or rich dilemma, right? Uh, it's a matrix. It's very simple. And it's, you know, whether you want to be rich and give away a, a bunch of equity or whether you want to be king and own all the control over what you're doing. Um, and I say a joke <laughs> because it's very simplistic, but it works. It really works. Uh, and it, it withstands very complex deals that still fall within that. Uh, and I would say that we definitely didn't do this because we wanted to be rich. If we wanted to mm -hmm. be rich fast, I would have been not to a school of architecture, but to investment banking. So I, that was really not the reason. Uh, but definitely we want to have impact. And in a startup, if you really have impact, you end up as a, as a consequence, perhaps creating a lot of value for other people, your investors, your employees, and yourself. That was mm -hmm. one. Okay, nice. But... Our main core, you know, our, our main north was impact, and it still is impact in optimization, in making an industry that we believe is so important for life and for economy more competitive, uh, improving the life of workers on 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 their day to day, their stress, and so on. The interest as well for the complexity of the industry was a challenge that we liked and that we still like, and the the opportunity of changing things in an industry that was so incipient. When we started, really, it was very, very incipient. And it still is one of the industries that is more, you know, uh, uh, the older, the, the, the least advanced in digitalization, although it's waking up very fast. But 
we wanted to be impactful. And I think that's an order in, in general in my life as well. Um, even if some of the decisions I take are quite silly based on that, but still, that was it. Uh, right now, our vision is to be the supply chain ecosystem of construction with right. a few objectives or, or quali- qualitative words on top of that. Being the most collaborative, being the most data-driven and based on that, the most efficient. And in progressively, and I say progressively because I believe it's the realistic vision, being the most sustainable. So right mm-hmm. now, to give you two big projects we're working on, one is using the data of the companies. The, so we, we operate, our softwares operate like private networks for each company, right? Their, their company, their subcontractors, and then all of that within a massive larger network. Okay. We are now working on how to mi- do the data mining of the past projects of our, of our clients input that in our software, which can be done already, and feed with that a business intelligence space where, whereby we can start doing some machine learning and artificial intelligence that helps to take better decisions on business, better procurement decisions, to price better your project so that your client, the developer, and so on, um, you you price it in a in a in a level that you can win and that you can then build a profit based on that. So you don't hinder your own, you know, your own capacity to build profit by lack of visualization of the data of your past or your future. We're working on that basically on adding AI, utilizing all the power of data that we already have to, to add AI power into the day to day of companies. And the key, the key thing with this is that when people speak about AI or all these terms, they, their mouths and their, minds kind of fill with you know power but then bringing that to earth is very hard and sometimes when you think about oh yeah these very big construction company they are applying ai i will never be able to do it i I think that the problem of that mindset is that they think that ai needs to be a layer superimposed to what they do some sort of of magical i don't know spaceship that lands in your business and you know owns a space perhaps fires a few workers and then occupies those two chairs. And, but it's not like that. In our opinion, it's something that needs to complement the, wor- the work of the company. And it needs to be deeply intricated or embedded in the core processes of the company. Otherwise, it will never pay the investment and it will never really be a fast, uh, a fast deployable uh, technology. And simple. We do that. We put AI at the center of one of the core processes, which is supply chain. Yep. Um, the other key thing for us is that when you look into construction and sustainability, uh, um, it's an ample word, but uh, let's focus on the CO2, um, CO2 impact of our industry. It's massive, right? As we all know. Um, embodied energy, embodied CO2, sorry, um, in construction is about 50% of the emissions of the industry, which is about 17 to 20% of global, depending on how you count that. But the thing is that we have to do something about it. And again, the big problem that happens, uh, in my opinion, is very similar to AI. Uh, When you try to be sustainable, you start superimposing procedures, uh, protocols, qualifications, and things that are a very long shot. And if you start thinking about sustainability in a construction company, then you start, you know, bringing this new department of sustainability and for us, it just doesn't work like that. What we believe is that you know supply chain is one of the core processes that are involved in the decision making of product systems and services that are the ones that are contribute to that CO2 embodied CO2 emissions. So mm-hmm. if we blend that with the accounting of carbon, then we can bring, first of all, we are far ahead from those that start from scratch because we are already kind of owning the process. We know the process, we have the data and so on. And second, we can add much more value in a much more realistic and short-term way. Uh, so our, I, our R&D projects are related to that, right? To how can we couple the day-to-day operational processes of carbon tracing uh, or more than carbon tracing before that, even carbon accountability or accounting Uh, embodied carbon accounting into the day-to-day of supply chain processes. And once you do that with a degree of precision that is not plus minus 1%, but plus minus perhaps 10, 15%, 
then you're already adding a massive value and then we'll take it from there, you know, but we are before um, blending those two worlds together because it's where we believe they should be, you know, together. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So, so for the rest of 2023, what are some of your kind of main goals? Well, I, I think that as any startup, almost uh, fundraising, we're at the moment fundraising and uh, we are in the halfway, I would say, but uh, very keen on you know speaking to funds uh, and we are planning on closing that in Q2, 2023. Uh, mm-hmm. But I would say early Q2, uh, so half of Q2, 2023. And then basically now we are growing in our in the so we we have developed these r d projects with some big construction companies that we hope that get the go ahead in the in 2023 so we can start working on that um but in the more short term we want to keep growing our network of general contractors and subcontractors um so that we can become a relevant aggregated procurement capacity player um uh and together with the ai we can start adding a lot of efficiency to the to the market. That's one of our core parts. And the other part is growing our base of manufacturers that we help to industrial uh, to, to digitalize uh, all their sales uh, and ecosystem of, of B2B clients. So that's uh, a new segment we're entering and that um, seems to have a lot of potential and we want to grow there. Yeah, that's where we are. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Um, as always, Geronimo, absolutely fascinating. And and Buildia is, yeah, the enormous amount of innovation and talent that's involved in, in that and a very uh, thoughtful um, set of solutions to quite complex problems. So thank you very much for sharing um, about Buildia today. Much appreciated. Thank you, Ryan. It's uh, always a pleasure to have this conversation and uh, to, you know, to be able to share our story, uh, our humble story. Uh, there are a lot of challenges ahead, definitely. But uh, what is important is that we like the step by step. and We're very, very committed to the impact. And hopefully we can do it and we can grow and actually make a difference. So, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.